In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We give thanks to you, O Lord our God, for receiving the waters of this life that we can walk across from bondage onto dry land. Amen. We give thanks to you, Lord, for your covering, for your mercy, for your loving care unto us and to all creation. Amen. O Lord our God, bless us indeed to be so merciful that we might obtain mercy. O Christ our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. All right, it is good to be with you. It is good to be able to cause some trouble for my brother from another mother <laughs> and return the favor so often given to me. Uh, Case and I went to seminary together, and had it not been for him, I don't think I'd have survived Virginia. It's an incredibly interesting place. Uh, but thanks be to God. Uh, for the love and brotherhood uh, because we are able to do things such as this. And today I've been told, and hopefully Case didn't set me up, but it's possible. But today I've been told it's homecoming Sundays, right? Y'all heard that? Am I the only one that heard that? Okay, just check it, just check it, just check it. And <laughs> homecoming Sunday, as in the first Sunday that you are back from your summer schedule, correct? Something like that, all right, okay, we're on the same page. Um, but homecoming might seem like something a little outdated. Something from your young adulthood. Something that no longer has much relevance for us. Because, you know, we don't go to homecoming too much no more. Unless there's a football game, a good football game. It's going to take a real good football game, right? But the point of returning home is to reconnect, to rekindle that relationship that once was, that relationship that mattered so much. And so we must question what keeps us from coming home, right? With school. You know, the universities that we went to however many years ago, we're not going to tell nobody's age. But it could be simply the distance. You know, I, I, my school, my beloved school, I went to eight schools. Y'all got to forgive me. So, But the school that I chose to claim and go to homecoming is in Bowie, Maryland, Bowie State University. I used to go to homecoming every year when I lived in Laurel. But now I live in Orlando and, you know, you talk about that distance, you talk about that time that it takes to actually make it to homecoming, you talk about the finances. I can no longer just hop in my car and drive down the street. I got to get an airplane and a hotel and all that kind of stuff. And so you got that distance, that time, those finances that prevent you from coming home. But with family, you know, distance, time, and finances, should never be the problem, right? I mean, with family, it shouldn't be the problem, right? We, we, we use that excuse from time to time, right? Uh, but which of you parents would accept that excuse in perpetuity? You know, you might accept that excuse for a little bit of time if you understand that your children just graduated from college, maybe they just got married, maybe they just had a child, and you can understand that it gets complicated, but you would not accept that excuse for forever, right? And so, there is typically some sort of issue that is deeper than the distance, deeper than the time, deeper than the money that keeps you from coming home to family, right? And with the church, what indeed could be the excuse? No one's church, no one's church home should ever be so far away that it, it takes too long to get there, right? No one should be considered a church home where you can wake up in the morning and you can be like, eh, that's a little too far to drive this morning. I don't think I want to go. It should never take too long to get there. It should never cost too much to attend there, right? Like, you shouldn't have a church home where every Sunday you got to get on a plane and buy a plane ticket, right? right? But if that's the excuse that we use and give to ourselves, then there's likely some deeper issue. There is likely some discord that remains unforgiven, right? Maybe 
a discord from some other place, some other church, some other time, some other season in our lives. But a discord, nonetheless, that keeps us from coming home to the church. That something has happened to us, something has happened around us that we think should never happen in church. And you see, beloved, that's why in the gospel for today, chapter 18 of Matthew, verse 21, we read, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? You see, Peter wanted to know, how long must I put up with this nonsense? <laughs> you see, just a while back in the gospel according to Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20, when we are reading about discipline in the church, the Lord said this. He says, moreover, if your brother or sins against you, or sister, you know, but the language back then, but it, you know, women, you are not off the hook for this. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector or an IRS agent. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. But it's as if Peter is saying to the Lord, okay, Lord, I get that, but what if I've done all of that? What if I have done all of that, all that you have just said, but I cannot agree with this person? So clearly, we cannot be gathered together in your name, right, Lord? I just want to bind this person on earth right now so that you would bind them in heaven and I could be done with him or her because he or she refuses to listen to anyone, any sort of reason. They refuse to listen, not even to the church, Lord, will they listen. But he or she continuously drives me crazy because they keep coming back to me asking for forgiveness. So, Lord, how many times do I need to forgive him? Up to seven times? And much like our own efforts at reconciliation, our efforts at anti-racism and multiculturalism and diversity, our, our efforts at marriage, our efforts at parenting and family life. Lord knows about parenting, right? Ooh. Jesus. Our efforts at relationship, period, and our efforts at remaining in communion. We want to know, what do we need to do in order to check the box so that we can move on. Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Like, Lord, then after the seventh time, can I write him off and be done with forgiving? Why, beloved, why is it so hard for us to be forgiving? And so, if I were to title today's message, I would say to you, it is dangerous to know that God is forgiving. It is dangerous to know that God is forgiving. 
And I'm leaving so y'all can go tell the bishop anyway, but before you run and tell the bishop that we had a priest that said we should not know that God is forgiving, I want you to bear with me because that's what we see in the gospel message for today. Matthew 18, verses 27 through 30, then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. No sooner had this servant been forgiven a debt that would have taken many lifetimes to pay. 10,000 talents is many lifetimes worth of money. No sooner had the master forgiven this servant for a debt that would have taken many lifetimes to pay, he was out the door demanding payment from another servant and throwing that servant in jail just after he was spared a similar fate. How in the world is that possible? How could this be? Like, have you ever considered that question when you read that scripture? How could this be? How is it possible for this man to be forgiven and immediately do to another what could have just been done to him? This isn't weeks later. This isn't days later, this isn't hours later. It's scripture says that immediately he gets up, he goes out and he finds the first person and he says, pay me what you owe. How? How is such a thing possible? Answer this. Now I, Sometimes I ask rhetorical questions, and I know we good Episcopalians like to just listen to the priests preach, and, but ain't all questions rhetorical, so bear with me, right? Could it be, how is this possible? Could it be, could it be that he forgot what had just been done for him? Is that, is that possible? Could it be that he had just forgotten that? Surely he could not leave his master's presence and immediately just, poof, it's gone. Now I know, some of us have children, my son included. I say stuff to him and it's gone. But we're not talking about that, right? You know, how could it be? Is it possible? And if this servant did not forget the grace that was just given to him, if he did not forget what just happened, then clearly he had to have taken that grace for granted, right? Now, I want you to go on an imaginary journey with me. Just, just imagine some things with me, because I'd imagine that this master had developed a reputation for being gracious and merciful. I'd imagine that this, this wasn't the first time that the master had been merciful, right? Y'all can imagine that, right? This, this clearly wasn't the first time that all of a sudden he woke, woke up today and was like, you know what, I feel like being merciful today. I'd imagine that some of the other servants had come out from this master and bore witness to the mercy that they had just received. I'd imagine they'd come out and they'd say, Jim, you'd never believe what just happened to me. The master called me before him and he told me everything that I owed and told me he required payment and I begged him for forgiveness and he forgave me. I'd imagine that the word of his mercy and forgiveness spread all throughout the dominion, right? Can you imagine that? That something like that is probably the case with this master? And if you can imagine that, then certainly the people of that time could definitely imagine that. And so this servant knew that the master was forgiving. 
And because he knew without a doubt that the master was forgiving, he also knew what he needed to do, what he needed to say in order to compel the master's forgiveness. And so when he was called before the master and the master made him account for everything, he falls on his knees and he says, Master, please forgive me. I'm begging you. I will pay what I owe. And just like clockwork, the master forgives him. And he, yeah, I knew that would happen. And he goes on his way. Just as the story was told to him, he was forgiven. And just as the story was told to him, he went on his way. But you see, he wasn't really repentant. He took the grace of God for granted. God has to forgive. We say that ourselves. It is God's nature to forgive, right? That is the nature of God, that he is a forgiving God. We know this, and so God has to forgive, and so it does not matter what I do. So long as I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, the Lord have mercy on me. Sweet Jesus. And because he didn't truly consider the debt that he owed and consider that that debt would need to be repaid, he could not acknowledge nor could he receive the grace that had been given to him. And because he could not receive grace, he had no grace to give. He himself was incapable of being forgiving because he himself had never really experienced what it meant to be forgiven. And so, have you considered all that the Lord has already forgiven you. And having forgive, considered all that he has forgiven you, have you considered all that he will still have to forgive you for? <laughs> We ain't done sinning, right? <laughs> All of us are sinners and fall short of the glory of the Lord, right? So we, as long as we have breath, there is still a propensity for us to sin, right? Have you considered all that the Lord is still yet to forgive you for? Beloved, immediately after being forgiven, the servant in this parable could not bring himself to forgive another. Or rather, the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. And so his fellow servant fell on his knees, and at his feet begged the servant, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. And the master heard how his servant had forgiven his brother and summons this servant back to him and decides that he indeed was going to forgive this servant in the same way as he had forgiven his brother. You see, I ain't going to ask y'all this question because y'all might lie to me and we in church. But every Sunday, I do know this, every Sunday when you do come to church, we pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Hopefully y'all pray that more than just on Sunday, but you know, again, I'm not gonna ask you. 
We pray the Lord, pray meaning beg, we beg the Lord to forgive us our debts the way that we forgive our debtors. We beg the Lord to look at the way that we forgive others, forgive our brothers and sisters, and then we instruct the Lord, we direct the Lord, we implore the Lord to see how we forgive each other and then forgive us in the same way that you see me forgiving others. Brothers, sisters, the parable is clear. The Lord will indeed forgive you your debts in the same way as you forgive your debtors. So the question is clear. How would you rate the way that you forgive one another? How would you rate the way that you forgive one another in this household of faith in this church? How would you rate the way that you forgive one another in your homes, in your families, at your places of employment? How would you rate the ways in which you forgive one another out in the world? And are you satisfied with the way that you are being forgiven? That ain't got nothing to do with who offended you. Are you satisfied with the way that you are forgiving others. Because truly, brothers and sisters, the Lord will indeed forgive you in the way that you forgive one another. So may the Lord bless you with eyes to see truly the ways in which you forgive that the debt that we all accrue before God would remain forgiven. Amen.